Welcome, Praetors, to the hellacious battlefields of the 31st millennium, because today we're continuing our talk on the Siege of Chthonia. After a disastrous and rather embarrassing start from the Sons of Horus, who attempted the patented Doug method of putting all your units in the wrong place to die as hard as you can, didn't hold up. All right, it's a bold strategy, Cotton, but it does not pan out well, unless you get VP for dying. But regardless, the, the, the subtle victory, if you will, is that Varen Ashuradon has cemented his place as the undisputed leader of the Sons of Horus Force. And we mentioned in the last video, he moved all of his armies in orbit from the Presidium Arcs to just a place just outside of its guns, a big open plain where he can land and then meet his enemies on the ground. Which, quite frankly, is what he wanted to do since the beginning. But the rest of the Legion needed to be humble to satiate their bloodlust to listen to him. Which again, is already starting to show the fray of command and authority as the heresy goes on. And so today we're going to continue this, see what happens with the actual landing on Chthonia. Now one thing I'd like to add up top here, if you like this video and are interested in anything Games Workshop, Hobby Supplies at all, please consider using one of the affiliate links I have in the description down below for a country that works for you. I picked these businesses because they offer discounts on all kinds of hobby supplies, Games Workshop stuff. Whether it's models or tufts for your bases, big or small, every time you use them it goes directly to supporting me, my wife, our cats, this whole thing, and I could not thank you enough. And also, if you're looking for more chatting about the Horus Heresy as a game system or models, go check out Goonhammer as they have a whole bunch of tactics, blogs, and model reviews and features that I think that you will love. So as Varen is moving his fleet in the sky, we're going to kind of pivot our attention, our point of view, down to the Loyalist, who technically just had a great victory. But there's a lot of dissension and disunity amongst them at this point. Remember, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of minds at work here. A lot of people who think that they're all in charge. From among this, the Adeptus Mechanicus here on the planet and the Imperial Army both want to counter assault immediately. They're like, okay, we pushed them off at the drop pod assault. What we should do is go out and harass them so that they don't have a place to land. Right. Uh, we're going to deny any kind of foothold that they could hope to get. And the uh, Mechanicum, at this point, their main priority. Again, we have to stop the Titans. That's it. That's always going to be their number one goal. They're like, we're outnumbered with Titans. We need to equalize this. So maybe hitting them as they're landing is a great way to do that. But the Raven Guard vets, the Terminators who had just fought the Sons of Horus, and many of the other elements in the defense of Chthonia are like, no, that's dumb. Like, we're in walls now. Let's just stay in the walls. Why would we walk out of our defenses and go fight them? Ultimately, the decision is up to Garius, who chooses to go out and meet his enemy. He depletes the reserves of all of his garrisons, even the Presidium Arcs itself, that big, you know, fortress, you know, neural center of the entire defense network. And his logic is pretty simple. I'm an Imperial Fist. I do not give an inch to traitors. I defend every inch for Dorne and the Emperor. Even just the idea of letting them land on this planet unharassed is unacceptable. And all the Raven Guard guys are like, This is dumb. But regardless, Garius lays out his battle plan, which basically goes like this. Um, everyone's going to rush as fast as they possibly can to deny the Sons of Horus a solid footing. Xiphon fighters are going to go in and start lighting up transports. Speeders are going to arrive and, and jet bikes. Shooting at anyone who does manage to get to the ground. Garius and his troops are going to come with like Stormhawks and in bigger transports. Hey, even a Titan. But the problem is... All of these defenses that are trying to root out any, you know, hint of landing by the Sons of Horus, they all move at different speeds. The Xiphon fighters will be there in a couple hours. The Titan's going to take a couple days. And so these forces are going to trickle in. And so the question is, can the, the light harassing things keep off the traitor forces long enough for the bigger ones to show up and then just cement that they cannot have an inch on this planet? Well, as the uh, descent begins, the traders start off this whole thing with 60 guys and some barbed wire on the ground, right? Just whatever their crafts could deliver quickly 
and they're trying to create any kind of beachhead or perimeter. They unleash all of their anti-air, meaning their Xiphon fighters, all that kind of stuff, uh, to protect any kind of lander that's coming down. And there's actually even a note here about a landing craft that was shot down and crushed a bunch of Raven Guard. I mean, it's just a, a sad thing of like, we didn't have to be here. And, you know, this story, it's a very interesting one. I would encourage you to go read it, but it's a lot of back and forth. And really what it comes down to is Garius's gambit begins very quickly to fall apart. They cannot clear out the infantry faster than they are being landed. And as time went on, it becomes more and more clear. By the time Garius decides to fall back, half his army is not even present at the battle. Remember, they're trickling in. But what they're starting to land is things like tanks and artillery. And so all of a sudden, those light skirmishers, speeders, and jet bikes cannot handle what's coming. And with this, Garius has another failure. And he seeds the, the base of a mountain, which is where the traders set up outside of the hive city. Uh, he just gives it to him. He's just like, I can't defend that. I can't keep them off. But because he's already committed to this plan, there's now an issue. The armor side of his army is still coming. Like, even if they stopped to turn around at this point, they're still exposed. They're out in the open, right? If a Titan takes three days to get from point A to point B, and in the middle of that you tell them to go home, it still takes a day and a half to go home. And Garius is like, well, you know, it was just the speeders that didn't fail. So we'll let them have this little mountain cove. We'll come back the next day with Titans and we'll just blow up the whole mountain. In fact, don't tell a Titan to turn around. The speeders will stop and just kind of give them a little bit of time to breathe. They think they'll safe. And then all of a sudden our Titans will come in and just wipe this all off. What he could not have accounted for was the extreme efficiency that the traitor forces unleashed and set up with. Okay, they went from 60, remember I said it started with 60 dudes, to 500,000 marines and over a 1,000 vehicles on Chthonia in a day. Now, with this, we see it was kind of like a flash-in-the-pan fight. Right, we're going to go out there and harass them and stop them, and then it doesn't work, and then it just kind of gets shattered, and you're like, why was that relevant? But what we're looking at here is... Neither side is above making foolish mistakes. And with this, Varen secures the landing spot that he wanted and is able to marshal one heck of an army. And what's important to note here is that he did not risk a single Titan to do it. He's keeping those cards up his sleeve. And that next day, once he's got a half a million Marines at his disposal, Asheron's ready and waiting. And so he sends out teams of Alpha Legion scouts, and they explain to him the tanks are coming and that the Loyalists greatly outnumber the traitors. But the Loyalists didn't wait for reinforcements. So that, that next wave was coming, right? Something harder than speeders, but not quite the Titan. Maybe predators, that kind of stuff. That's what's coming down at them at this point. So after repelling that light assault wave last night, things begin to intensify. Varen deploys his armor. Remember we said they dropped like a thousand tanks to meet the Loyalist, and within a minute of the lines meeting, like a hundred tanks from both sides are just annihilated. And it unfolds kind of like a World War I style killing ground where you've got trenches kind of being crudely dug and there's all kinds of machines just blowing up, making cover, and there's smoke, it's just a mess. There's bodies, tanks, and guns everywhere. And this is just a defense force. Like they're just the guys who are coming down to set up camp. The point is just to keep the, the Loyalist tanks off of the landers because every minute that Varen has here is more power in his favor and things are looking good until he hears a blaring horn on the horizon. Varen looks over and there are a total of 15 knights waddling their way towards the traitors and they immediately begin a long range bombardment that's picking the traitors apart. So now there's a tank battle going on, we have scouts all around monitoring things and now the Titans are beginning to descend in like this new wave of warfare. Remember, Garius is like, oh yeah, our Titans are just going to walk up and they'll just hose them off the side of the planet and we'll be fine. Varen relays this to Orbit and is told to look up and then he sees his Titans now arriving. Remember, he kept them in orbit because the only safe place in Warhammer 40k or 30k is to be off the table in reserves. And now he brings them in. Right? Once the enemy has shown theirs, then you play yours. And here's the thing about uh, Varen Asuridon's Titans. He has 40 of them. And the depiction we get for this particular battle is one where those 40 Titans are being landed while Varen is buying time for them with his defensive actions. 
Everything is just to make nice open spaces for landers to drop them safely so they can jump right into the fight. And when I say into the fight, I mean like these dudes are dropping titans like on the doorstep of the 15 loyalist ones. Like they're just immediately in the fight. There's three different traitor titan legions represented. And at the seeing this, right, at the immensity of what is coming down from orbit at them, the loyalist titans at this point uh, realize we need to kind of do the same thing that the iron hands were trying to do up in orbit, right? We only have one strike with 15 knights. What can we do? Well, we have to take out as many of the enemy knights as possible to level whatever playing field we can. And so those loyalist ones kind of fall into a, a running formation towards the traitors. They kind of go into a cool like charging pattern and start moving towards the, the traitor ones. The problem is the traitor ones were deployed in sort of like an all over the place formation. So like overlapping fire and again, they were dropped immediately into the fight. And so this ends the same way that that Iron Hands ones does. There's not going to be a decisive, you know, swiping of your last Titans as we do an epic grand finale battle. They just got wiped. The shields couldn't protect every direction at once and 40 titans tends to outnumber 15 any day of the week the loyalist ones are struck down one of them was a war master titan and with that all of the loyalist tanks were treated garia sinks and broods because dang he has lost a lot so like all my videos let's end this one talking about why is this cool why was this part of the story relevant and important uh for a few things one this is a big punch back right the bad boys my guys sons of horus have landed and fought hard for that landing space and as i was reading this part of the story i just kept thinking man wouldn't it be really cool to have a whole bunch of drop pods and an extra thousand marines right here because that's pretty much what got annihilated in an instant the minute they did the drop pod assault in the last video like they really probably could have used those things but beyond that we get to see varin act as a really awesome leader at this point because he likes to leave room for maneuver right there's there's no room for error when you drop pot assault on the dude's doormat there is though when you can create different types of distraction battles or lines of defense so that you can reinforce your position and have overlapping firepower like he just he really understands the nature of ground warfare which is probably why he wanted to do this in the first place and it paid off now let's talk titans this makes me want to learn to play Adeptus Titanicus because the scene here that I described was just really cool. Walls of big machines with little guys running around at their feet. Uh, actually, now that looking at it with uh, the models that we've been seeing uh, showcased online, it sounds like the perfect setup for a game of Imperialis or Epic or whatever it's called. So I am excited for that whenever it comes out. But one thing I wanted to cover here, it doesn't actually come up in the linear story, but it's more of a sidebar. And we learned that the word bearers that are accompanying the sons of Horus are up to something dubious. Their, their leader, this allied force leader, Zedek Mordekar, has plans within plans. We understand that he's letting the inductide die viciously to enact some kind of ritual. Varen put him in charge of blunting the enemy advance, kind of using the word bearers as a meat shield, but Mordekar didn't care because it gives him control on where and when to commit his forces and so he gets to dictate where the bloodshed is. We're told that there's many locations of arcane power across Cthonia, and so it seems that the word bears have a ritual in mind where they're going to lead the traitor forces by the nose to dictate fights in certain places so that they can, under the nose of the Sons of Horus, enact a huge ritual which they say is uh, sort of kind of being run by Erebus. Also, last note here, I adore the fact that since nobody trusts or wants to work with the Alpha Legion, the only thing meaningful they've done lately is like, go away and look around. <laughs> nobody wants you here, Alpharius. <laughs> it was kind of funny to me. Anyway, friends, let me know your thoughts on Siege of Cthonia Part 2 in the comments down below. I would love uh, if you would share this video with someone who is Horus Heresy curious, as I am trying to cover that more and more on the channel. So let me know in the description down below what you'd like covered, and I will talk to you next time. Happy Wargaming.